in Psalms 119. I, I got one, verses 161 through 168. Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word like one who finds grace for it. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your guidance and grace. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stand. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and the good of your children. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Again, we are going to be working our way through Ephesians 1, verses 20 through 23, and Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 5. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Starting at Ephesians 1, verse 20, it is an odd place to start, but we ran out of time last week, so that's where we stopped. But before we, we dive into those verses, we must do what we always do. We must first back up, review what we talked about last week so that we keep everything in its proper context. So last week, we made our way through Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 19. And it's in those verses we read that Paul is encouraging the believers in the church of Ephesus. And really all of Asia Minor as well because that church was going to pass through that entire region. But it's also including us today, church. So Paul is letting them know that he's heard about their faith in the Lord Jesus. And what does that true faith do? What changes in that person, that, that true faith? Well, the church in Ephesus, it brought them to hunger for the word of God. That's what it should still be doing today. Every single believer in here, because of what Christ has done, because of the plan of the Almighty Father and the working of the Holy Spirit regenerating your heart, your faith should drive you to the word. You should love the word, embrace the word, crave the word. Not only did the church in Ephesus do that during that time, but they also desired to be with the body to worship. This is what Paul has heard, and, and he's encouraging the church to continue to do that. But most importantly, most importantly, Paul heard that this church loved Christ above all things. And because Christ was their first love, what comes from that? That they love other believers. That they love and take care of their brothers and sisters in Christ. And church, this is a result of their salvation, love towards all the saints. And we said this last week, that this wasn't just an exception for the church in Ephesus. This is for the church universal until the second coming, that we are to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because look what Christ did, church. Sacrifice. He was the perfect sacrifice for what reason? To redeem the sinner. That's what he did for us, that love. So how can we not love our brothers and sisters? For we too, because of our faith, should love them. Because they are in Christ. Paul continues in his letter that he is thankful for them and that he is continuously praying that God gives them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Again, for the, for the true believer, this is exactly what happens. The spirit 
of wisdom reveals to them the triune God and who he is. That's why the word is so important, because that's the only way in which we today can comprehend who God is. That's why the church in Ephesus loved to come together. They wanted to learn about God. They wanted to know all of his, of his attributes. They wanted all of him, not just the attributes they liked. Many of churches today want to hype visions and dreams. And yet they don't bother to open their Bible. Listen, we have to understand the canons are closed. This is where our truth comes from. This is how we know God the Father. The spirit of wisdom gives us that revelation through the word and the word alone. The problem is, is that man in their fallen state doesn't want this. They do not want to know God. Again, many of them may like some of his attributes, but they do not want all of them. But a true believer does. So they yearn to learn about him. But before this happens, church, but before that sinner becomes a believer, what did Paul tell the church in Ephesus? He tells them that it is God who enlightens the eyes of their heart. And what does this mean? This means that it is He by way of the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, who regenerates the dead heart of man, bringing them to life so that they can now hear the truth, read the truth, and receive it. So even the knowledge of God that the believer, believer desires to have comes from God. And with that knowledge comes the yearning to be conformed to the image of the Son, to strive and act as He did, to think as He thinks. Your whole worldview is going to be changed. Everything about the believer will change. From their actions to their thought process. And it's all because of what God has done. Do you understand? This is the reason why, as believers, that we cannot boast in ourselves when it comes to our salvation. Because it is God who has done the work in us. So once that fallen man has been regenerated, comes the understanding of the riches of the glorious inheritance that's been given to the saints. This is the understanding of what God has done in rescuing the believer. And, and this is where a lot of churches separate. This is the reason why we here at Christ Reformed Church embrace the words when it comes to predestined election, adoption, redeemed, forgiven. Why? Because this is how God rescued the sinner. He predetermined the day that it was going to happen. He chose you before the foundation of the world. He rescued you. And during that rescue process, He, by way of the Son, sends the Holy Spirit down to dwell within the believer, sealing them. Meaning you cannot lose your salvation. Because if it was you, O oh man, who gained it, you, O oh man, would lose it. 
This is what God has done to rescue fallen man. This is what he is continuing to do. Understand, if you are a believer in here today, he's rescued you and sealed you according to the working of his great might. All right, moving into verse 20. Continuing, he says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And now, of course, this is speaking of the Holy Spirit, the, the very one who regenerated that dead heart of yours. Well, he is still dwelling in the believer. And the very Holy Spirit that is dwelling in the believer today is the same Holy Spirit who brought Christ from the dead. And, and this is exactly what he did to you. Not from physical death, but from a spiritual death. For your heart was spiritually dead, and it wanted nothing to do with God until the Holy Spirit brought life to that dead heart. You will hear me say this time and time again. He regenerated that heart so that you would believe in Him. Now that same Holy Spirit that dwells in you is the same Spirit that has Jesus ruling and reigning in the heavenly realm. Now there are going to be times in your life when you are going to struggle with your faith. But listen, the power is in you to crush that struggle. God has given you that power so that you can be secure in your salvation. For there is no problem too great or too powerful for the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. Church, that's exactly what needs to happen when your worries become your idol. You rely on the Holy Spirit to bring you back to the Word, to give you that wisdom, to dive into the Scripture, to rely on that brother and sister. When you as a believer feel powerless in the faith, look what the Holy Spirit has done. He has brought Christ back from the dead and placed Him on the throne where He rules over all things. I say this again, this is the same power dwelling within you. Now, every single one of us in here, we are, we are still in the flesh and we are still going to sin. And there will be times you will doubt. But the power of the Holy Spirit is far greater than any sin you'll ever commit or any doubt that you will ever have. He has you sealed. Now Paul continues about this power that has Jesus. Look at verse 21. That has Jesus far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. This power. Look at it. Jesus rules over all things, past, present, future, all things. This is the reason why we do not look to the worldly for encouragement. This is the reason why we definitely do not look to Washington, D.C. for encouragement. For the one we look to rules and reigns over all things. Every single person who has been placed in the office, whether it be president, congress, senate, emperor, king, whatever the place may be, Christ rules over them. They are there serving a purpose, and the purpose is to glorify God. But they are also there serving a purpose. 
And that is either to reward the nation for their obedience to God or punish them. You look at the state that we are in today, and I'll let you make the decision where we are as the United States and where God stands with us. So he rules over past, present, and future. And when this world is destroyed, and he brings about the new heaven and new earth, it is Christ who is still going to be ruling and reigning. What what does this mean? It means it is a done deal, church. The throne is his. Satan cannot overthrow him. The world cannot change what has already been done. And and what does that say to you, believer? That nothing can thwart your salvation. Nothing can change the plan that God has for you and how you are going to glorify Him. Why? Because Jesus rules over all things. Which means there is not a single being, object, fallen angel, or Satan himself that can take what God has given you. There's nothing that can remove God's love for the elect because of his power, his supreme authority, he rules and reigns. Now Paul goes on to say in verse 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. How wonderful it is for the believer to know and understand that there is no greater power over our Savior. What Christ says goes. There are no exceptions. There's no arguing to what he has said. What he has said is done. It stands. So think about that. When we come to the word, what what are we reading? The authoritative word of God. There's no arguing with it. There's no one here who's going to say, well, that's not really what that means. No, it's the word of Christ through and through. There are no mistakes The church today is ruled by Christ. That's why it is so important to be part of a body that is elder-led. It's important that when the elders lead, they're leading by going to the head of the church, and that being Christ. They're going to his word. But for you as well, you too can go to the word. And if your elders are leading you in a direction that isn't biblical, you need to call them out on them. Ask for a meeting. Sit down and go through that word with them. One of the biggest problems, the church in the West today, is that the pastor is a CEO. He is the one who calls all the shots. He has moved Jesus aside, and now he is trying to sit on the throne in which Christ reigns. That should never be church. Christ has spoken and how the church is to flow. And it is to be elder-led, not CEO-led. For we already have the one who is ruling and reigning, and he is perfect. So what does that say about the elder who wants to be a CEO? arrogance should be appalling to think that they know better than Christ verse 23 Paul continues it says which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all 
This shows the believer that the church, his body, is not complete until all the elect have been saved. So although the church isn't complete yet, it will be, and not a single one lost. For if one is lost, then how can the body be complete? But one cannot be lost. And why is that? Well, it's quite simple, church, because Christ rules and reigns over all things. And and this is truly amazing when, when you think about it, that the believer has this type of intimate relationship with the Son that he has been called to be part of his body? That the mighty power he has used to fulfill the purpose that he has for the sinner to be rescued? And once that sinner is rescued, that sinner will be brought in to the body, that being the church, And what will happen? That sinner who was regenerated will now go about fulfilling the good works that will glorify God. Again, this is why it is so important to be a part of the church. When we meet, you should want to be a part of that fellowship. This may offend some. But I do not understand from the word of God how one can claim to be a Christ follower and yet not want to meet with the body. Why would you want to neglect the body that that Christ has brought you in to? Now granted, I'll be honest with you, some bodies are harder to deal with than others. But you should not want to neglect the body of Christ when they come together to worship. Okay, so now we're We're heading into chapter 2 where Paul lays out what it means to receive salvation and to be a part of the church, that being the the body of Christ. We're probably not going to make it through the five verses. Just a heads up. Verse 1, starting out, And you were dead. This is everyone before salvation. You were spiritually dead. What can a dead person do? Nothing. You're dead. So if one is spiritually dead, can they respond to that which is spiritually alive? No. This is one of the major issues within the Puritan church, I mean the Protestant church today, I should say. This is the reason why we have reformed in our name. We are separated from those who believe in a free will understanding. Why? Because of sola scriptura, scripture alone. So it's here in the word dead, and this is God's word, by the way. Remember, Paul's writing, but he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, so this is the word of God. He, God himself, put it there. The free will side will look at this word, and they will say, well, it doesn't mean dead. And then often, what they'll want to do Instead of staying within the context of Scripture, they'll go to an analogy to skirt 
around the word dead. One analogy I heard recently from a theologian that doesn't like the way Paul uses the word dead goes something like this. This theologian says, well, being spiritually dead, it's like a man lying on his deathbed. He's so near death that he can't move, he can't speak, he's doing everything he can just to breathe. So they call the doctor. The doctor comes in, diagnoses the situation, and he tells the man, you're dying. But thankfully, I have the cure. The doctor pulls out the cure in a bottle. The dying man still doesn't move. He doesn't even reach up to take the medicine from the doctor's hand. He doesn't even reach to open the bottle and pour the cure into the spoon. So the doctor does it all for him. Takes the bottle, twists the top off, retrieves the spoon, pours the medicine into the spoon, and he leans over the patient. And, but even the patient can't even lift his head up to meet the medicine. So the doctor moves in closer right up to his lips, and he tells the patient, I'm going to need you to just open your mouth up for me and swallow so this medicine can work. Personally, I think it's a stupid analogy. Because what it's saying is this, that, that God has done all the work, but he still just needs the man to put in a little effort so that he can receive the saving work of God. Which brings us back to the word dead. A dead man doesn't open his mouth, and a dead man doesn't swallow. Why? Because he's dead. Really, a, a three-year-old can rationalize this out, but for some odd reason, we, the church, cannot. Why? Arrogance of man. Man wants to be part of salvation. It's hard for us to say that we want nothing to do with God, and if it wasn't for God doing the work, then we would want nothing to do with Him, because why? We are spiritually dead. So technically, for this analogy to be accurate, would mean that the doctor would walk in assess the patient and say, well, he's dead. What do you do then? You'd have to bring out the shock paddles. You see he, who's still doing the work here. It's not the corpse on the table. I feel like I'm kind of beating a dead horse, so I'll move on. <laughs> Let me just say this. So when the inspired word of God says, and you were dead... That's exactly what it means. This is man in their fallen state. From birth, you are a spiritual corpse that cannot respond to the spiritual truth. And the cause of this death is what? In the trespasses and sins. Now, the definition for trespass in the Greek means slip Fall, stumble, deviate, or go the wrong direction. The definition for sin in the Greek is the idea of missing the mark or to fall short of any goal, standard, or purpose. So for the fallen man from birth, that is who we were, who is spiritually dead, Paul is saying that they are running away from God, falling short of his standards and of his holiness. Man in his natural state is not dead because they commit sin, but because they are in sin. And this has been true of mankind since the fall of Adam. 
We, we have to grasp that trespasses and sins are not just the actions, but the realm in which man in their fallen state is in. For there are some pastors and theologians who hold to the understanding that one does not become a sinner until they commit their first sin. But church, God's word says otherwise. God's word says we are not sinners because we commit a sinful act. We commit a sinful act because we are sinners. And this was the state of all believers previous to their conversion. Verse 2 starts off, in which you once walked. Notice it doesn't talk about numerous walks that a non-believer takes place in. For there is only one. Don't let that slip by you. For you, O oh believer, that was the walk in which you were on, and it wasn't towards God. It was away from him. We'll stop there. But I'm not going to leave on that note. That was the hope of man, or that is the hope of man apart from Christ. But do not forget the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior. For it was God the Father who put the plan into place before the foundation of the world to send his perfect Son to this earth to become flesh, to walk this earth for 33 years, and in doing so, he did it without sin, making him what, church? The perfect sacrifice. So on that day that was predetermined before the foundation of the world, Christ was arrested, beaten, and nailed to the tree. Why? To pay the believer's sin debt in full. So as Christ is hanging on that cross, bleeding out, God's wrath is being poured out upon him. The very wrath that every single one of you in here deserve. So on that day, the believer's sins were imputed to Christ, that being past, present, and future. And Christ imputed his righteousness to the believer, past, present, and future. It looked as if sin had won out, but it hadn't, for it had been crushed once and for all. Christ was in the tomb for three days, but by way of the Holy Spirit, he arose from the dead. We know that 40 days later, he ascended into heaven. And upon his ascension, he sent the Holy Spirit down to regenerate the heart of God's elect. And when that heart was regenerated, the believer would hear the word for the first time, the truth for the first time. And you know what they did? They embraced it. Many will say, well, you still have a choice. And I say, yes, you're right. You now have a choice because God has regenerated your heart and you will always choose God. So for those of you in here today who are followers of Christ, do not forget the great price that was paid for your soul. And it was done out of love. Now for those of you in here who are not in Christ, 
please grab one of the elders. Grab someone in here that you may be friends with. But if you're struggling with this, do not leave here today without talking to someone. Please, I beg of you. Let us pray.